In the 1950s Japan, two other men are working. Um, one of them, uh, Yutaka Taniyama, uh, is not really a man of means. Uh, so he's having to work through college and doesn't quite have the sway that uh, some other men of, of different countries, different times, different means might have uh, had access to. But he manages to connect automorphic functions, and we saw those when we were looking at Poincaré. He connects those automorphic functions to the complex plane um, and then to elliptic curves. He meets Goro Shimura and as they're trying to put together a conference in Japan talking about the, the prominent and important math of the day. And they conjectured that every elliptic curve over the rational numbers. Now, we've identified Fermat Sus theorem as an elliptic curve. Um, we've and now we're able to talk about the elliptic curves being uniformized by a modular form. Now we saw modular forms as well when we looked at Poincaré. But very specifically, what their conjecture says is that if we were to take the complex plane, and really just the upper quadrant of the complex plane, and convert that into a torus, like a donut, that particular surface would have all these solutions to elliptic equations over the rational numbers, over complex numbers. Now, Gauss's work, um, talking about Diophantine equations, led to elliptic equations. So now we're taking Gauss's work on Diophantus and elliptic equations and tying it to his work with complex numbers. And now we're also taking it in and applying that to some non-Euclidean geometries in the shape of a torus. So, all that being said, Fermat's last theorem would also be on that surface. kind of important. If we can restrict where we would where we might find Fermat's last theorem graphically, then we might be able to find a solution to it or prove that it doesn't actually exist at all. So Barry in Missouri comes along uh, now we're into the late 80s. Now he's writing an influential paper regarding modular forms and ideals. The topics that we've seen before, but the way that he ties them together sparks the interest of Gerhard Frey. Gerhard Frey starts connecting modular curves and Galois theory and, and Galois groups and elliptic curves and then suggests that if Taniyama and Shimura were right that their connection of uh, elliptic curves and modular forms is correct then the Fermat Slash Theorem would be proved. Ken Rebay comes along and he doesn't really prove that Taniyama and Shimura uh, and their conjecture are correct. He does prove that if Fry is right, well, then we would have a solution to Fermat's last theorem. So, Rebe just connects Fry's disjointed theorem to the rest of the train. And, and, and he is able to prove that in ways that are far beyond what I'm able to do with math right now. But here's some of the gentlemen we're talking about. Now, remember, Gerhard Fry is the one who suggests that we can prove Taniyama Shimura, we prove Fermat Sass theorem. Uh, Barry Mazur is the one who uh, wrote the paper that's going to spark the interest of Andrew Wiles. Andrew Wiles is actually going to confide in Ken Rebe. Now, Ken's also proved Fry's conjecture earlier, but um, Ken and Andrew, or Rebe and Wiles, uh, do share a, a neat connection as the story unfolds. Andrew Wiles was uh, at the library one day and ran across what he thought was a very easy problem about x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Soon after that uh, is when he discovered Fermat's theorem and thought that that seems easy enough or interesting enough. I want to take a look at that. He spent the rest of his mathematical career chasing the solution to Fermat's last theorem. Once he finished uh, his graduate school uh, his doctoral program at Cambridge. He actually spent seven years virtually isolated in his house and at work working to develop a proof for Fermat Sass theorem. Uh, he worked upstairs in, in his house and no one else came up there. Uh, he saw very little of his family. When he was at work he would hide in his office. Uh, he wouldn't share anything with anybody for fear that 
if he was to share any piece of what he's developed, then someone would come along, steal it, and claim it as their own. Sadly, that does happen in the math community. Um, but what he was able to do is transform elliptic curves into Galois representations. Now, as he gets a little further into this, he starts recognizing the need for assistance. So um, he's contacted his former advisor at Cambridge. His, his advisor says, you know what, you should try this, this new system that a couple of my students are working on. It's an Euler system, um, and you might be able to use that to prove Tanayama and Shimura were correct. So, Wiles is taken uh, in another direction by Mazur, who's suggesting that we extend the work of Kumar and Didikind in the work on ideals. Perhaps we can switch from one set of elliptic curves to another. Now, he's been transforming elliptic curves into Galois representations, so there's some connection between what he's been working on. By the time we get to June 1993, Wiles has, has got a 200 page proof of the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. Uh, he actually opened up in the past, in the last year or two before that, uh, to one of his colleagues at Princeton, uh, swore him to secrecy, uh, and together he was able to bounce some, they were able to bounce some ideas off. Those ideas led to this 200 page proof of the Tami, Taniyama Shimura conjecture. Um, he doesn't give a whole lot of warning that he's going to be talking about that. His, that the titles of his uh, his presentations were a little bit vague and ambiguous. Uh, certainly not what the people that were going were anticipating. The story has it that the first day it was sparsely attended, but as people started recognizing towards the end of that one what was happening, the second day the place was nearly full. By the time he came back for his third lecture he almost didn't make it in because there were so many people in attendance. Um, as he gets to the very end of his third lecture, he's proved, he's, he's completed his proof of the Taniyama Shimura conjecture, famously says, I think I'll stop here. Now, so much of the math that he was talking about was well over people's heads, but they all had the idea that something important just happened. And as it turns out, very much so. Um, by proving the Taniyama Sh Shimura conjecture, he's now connected their work to Fry's conjecture that, again, if Taniyama and Shimura were right, that the Fermat's last theorem would be proven. So in effect, he has proven Fermat's last theorem to be true, that there are no integer solutions for that problem. He hasn't published yet, and so that's the next step in the process. Unfortunately, one of his friends and fellow workers at Princeton catches an error. That error took him a year to fix. The section that, where the error was was in that Euler system, that, that new piece of math that had been developed by uh, Wiles' ad advisor and, and some of his students at Cambridge. Wiles found a way to take that part out and replace it with the topic of his dissertation something called horizontal Iwasawa theory. It turns out it worked perfectly in the conversions of, for those elliptic curves that he had been working with. Now in that year he didn't make a whole lot of progress until his sudden epiphany to replace it with uh, horizontal Iwasawa theory. Richard Taylor was a former student of his, recognized that Wiles was having some issues, had some time, and went over to help Wiles. During the time that they worked together, they didn't come up with any useful headway in that error. Taylor had left by the time, um, or before, Wiles comes up with horizontal Iwasawa theory as the band-aid for the proof. Even so, he shares the credit with Richard Taylor for his proof, and it gets published in 1995. So Fermat's theorem is finally proved, which brings us to this question. Did Fermat actually have a proof? He says he did. He just said that the margin was too small to contain it. Based on the difficulty and the variety of the math, uh, reliance on math that wasn't even available to Fermat, 
The answer is probably not. Now, much like Euler, Euler had a proof for n equals 3. Turns out it was a little flawed. So there's a chance that Fermat had a proof, but it wouldn't be anything that we would consider complete and robust uh, by modern times. There are two implications that I really see, well, three implications that I really see um, from this particular story. First of all, there is a lot of math out there, and there are a lot of, ma a lot of mathematicians throughout the ages that have worked to contribute towards solutions in each of those fields. Um, I think it's important that we recognize that all these maths interplay, and that when we start interacting with that math as well, then we become part of the story of the history of math. Secondly, perseverance is essential. We think we've all ran across that one problem, in math or otherwise, that just seems to be uncrackable. Um, Weil spent seven years of his life almost by himself working on this problem. And even before then, he had geared himself up through high school and college and graduate school working towards solving this problem. So the idea that, uh, that we should not avoid that tough problem, but find a way to, to solve it, to fix it, whatever we need to do with that problem, seems to me like a huge implication from this story. Don't give up. The third implication is this. While some of these, his, some of these historical figures worked in isolation, and I think of Galois, I think of Abel, who just died too young to share their stuff. Um, I think of Wiles uh, working by himself and not sharing for fear of theft. Um, no man is an island. We are really all in this together. Um, working together towards a problem should mean that we get more problems solved. So here are a few review questions for you. And last but not least, here are some resources for you if you wanted to do a little bit more research into Fermat's last theorem for yourself. Thank you for being uh, an attentive, attentive audience. Have a good day.